Greetings, my friends. We are all interested in the Plan 9 by 9 podcast, for that is where you and I are going to spend the next hour of our lives. And remember, my friends, podcasts such as these are made possible by listeners like these. David Heath, Trevor McKay, the H.P. Lovecraft Film Festival, and how could we fail to mention Chris McMillan. Let us punish the guilty. Let us reward the innocent, my friends. Can your hearts stand the Plan 9 by 9 podcast? For the first time, we are bringing to you the full story of what happened. What plan will you follow now? Plan 9. It's been absolutely impossible to work through these Earth creatures. Their soul is too controlled. Why do I get hooked up with these spook details? Monsters, graves, bodies. Oh, all right. Well, it was covered up by the higher echelon. I am a soldier of our planet. We did not come here as enemies. We came only with friendly intentions. To talk. To ask your aid for the whole universe. But your governments of Earth refused even to accept our existence. Flying saucers, Captain, are still a rumor. Now toddle off and fly your flying machine, darling. But if you see any more flying saucers, will you tell them to pick another house to buzz? Minutes later, the police arrived at the scene. Who found them? The man and girl. The morgue wagon ought to be along most any time. You get their statement? Yeah, they're pretty scared. Finding a mess like this ought to make anyone frightened. You believe there are such things as flying saucers, Colonel? I'll tell you one thing, if a little green man pops out of me, I'm shooting first and asking questions later. You realize there's a government directive stating that there is no such thing as a flying saucer. You're a headstrong young man. Those incidents in the graveyard these past few days has just got me worried. Don't like hearing noises, especially when ain't supposed to be any. Yeah, sort of spooky-like. Shall we talk now or wait? Go ahead, my friend. It's time for Plan 3, Part 3 of Plan 9 from Outer Space here at the Plan 9 by 9 podcast. I am a cold-ridden Derek M. Cook, and as always, I've got my partner in cinematic crime, Scott Morris. How you doing, man? Hey, I'm doing good, but I, I've got something I need to tell you, something I wasn't able to put together. I know you asked me that you needed this for this episode, and I just wasn't able to do it. I was trying to make some stock footage of just me recording, saying a whole bunch of different things that you could drop into this episode. <laughs> I wasn't able to do it. <laughs> yeah, this this clip does have quite a bit of stock footage, and we're going to talk about that with this episode's guest, uh, a dear friend of mine. She's been on my Monster Kid Radio podcast quite a bit. She's an incredible writer. She's just a great person. It's Dominique Clamsies. How you doing? Pretty good. How about you? Well, I'm sick, but she yeah. is also the creator of the official plan nine by nine pillow. Yes. Inspector Clay for the win. T- tell yes. us about that. Me or Scott? Either one of you. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, go ahead. It was your it was your special commission. Go ahead. Yes, I, I did uh, make a special commission for a zombified Inspector Clay pillow, and it is amazingly awesome. I can't believe how well it turned out. And it's a quite big pillow and it is a very comfy pillow. And uh, I'm not ashamed to say that I have actually slept with uh, Inspector Clay. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm glad you enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> you have been over to the website at plan9by9.com to see the action shot of Scott um, enjoying his pillow. Right. I was actually quite pleased by how it turned out too. There was there were some dicey moments in the making, but no, it turned out good. We'll make sure there's a picture of this on the website so that people can check it out. That it is an amazing pillow, and I, I love it so much. <laughs> we'll make sure there's a picture of it uh, on the website for the the podcast here. Maybe an action pose with Scott sleeping on it or something. I don't know. We'll, we'll post a link to Dominique's etsy shop as well which is where you can pick up other fine pillows and other amazing crafts it is the house of silent graves and there will be a link in the show notes yes i've got plenty of different pillows of the same design including the blackula one which is the one i sleep with (laughs) so if people order this blackula one is that the one they get or do they get a new one no i'm not giving anybody my blackula pillow just curious (laughs) 
Uh, but Dominique's got pillows. She's got a service dinosaur, Tinglers, which I'm a big fan of. Oh, yeah. Tinglers are amazing. I've got one, too. Oh, uh, they were a huge hit at this past Monster Bash last year. Uh, the Tinglers are great. Just all sorts of cool stuff. So go check that out when you're done listening to this episode, of course, because we've got some real business, some real meaty movie stuff to talk about. But before we get to Plan 9 from Outer Space, Dominique, Scott and I have a question for you. And do you want to take this away, Scott? We know what Plan 9 is. What do you think one of the first eight plans would have been? Mm, okay. So, given the way these aliens work, I'm thinking it's probably something like putting pennies on railroad tracks <laughs> to get to, to screw up infrastructure or like having old ladies withdraw all their money and give it to them in a scam of some sort that's unnecessarily complicated stuff like that i can't see them as doing anything much bigger than that i mean you know they rose three dead people when they finally had the ability to raise dead people so i'm not seeing them getting very successful at anything else okay i like that pennies on railroad track <laughs> Now well, I want. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say we've been asking each of our guests what they think is, and as a surprise, you have to wait for Plan Nine, the last episode. Derek and I are all are going to reveal what we think one of the first nine plans are. Awesome. It'll be fun. Although now I want uh, an official Plan Nine by Nine Penny, <laughs> <laughs> and I want one of those scam spam emails from some Nigerian prince or whatever, start floating around, <laughs> but have it be from the ruler or something, you know, or, or Eros, you know, looking for help. <laughs> when, when she mentioned scamming old women out of money, I'm a big fan of the Dragnet television show. And there are several episodes where they're working in Bunko and they bust people that are taking old women's money. So that's where my mind went was thinking, oh, having Plan 9 on and Dragnet mixed together. That sounds cool. Oh, wow. Yeah, it does. I'd watch that. Well, okay, because there was an episode of The Saint. It was actually the one that had Ingrid Pitt in it, which is why I watched it. It's the only episode of The Saint I've ever been. But it's about, like, some Bunko artist who's stealing money from a church. Okay. So, oh. yeah, maybe they could do church stuff. I don't know. <laughs> okay, so, so so now I want to have The Saint in there, so Roger Moore will also show up. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Roger Moore, Jack Webb, Harry Morgan, and Bunny Breckenridge. Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> I, I am so there. <laughs> I'm all in fan film writers or fan fiction writers. Get to that. Get to work. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow. So um, plan nine by nine. Uh, I'm sorry. Plan eight. Plan eight. What am I doing? Scott, what are we doing? I'm sorry. I need a moment. <laughs> uh, we are on plan three, the third nine minutes of the movie. Uh, this is not the first time we see the iconic newspaper. I, I think it's the second time we see it in the film, but the first time in this segment. The Dead Walk or something? <laughs> no, that's the wrong film, Scott. Oh, so, sorry. <laughs> oh, so this is, you're talking about the one that Ed Wood Jr. picks up at the beginning of the film. <laughs> Saucer's <laughs> Scene Over Hollywood. And... This is, again, one of these things that I want to see out in the market, like a, a prop newspaper with that in it. I don't know if the stories themselves would say, but I just want that headline, you know? <laughs> yeah, the, supposedly that first time you see it, uh, Ed Wood is the person that stumbles in there and picks up the uh, newspaper. Oh, really? I, you see, I've, I've heard that, but I watched that scene quite a bit, and I, I can't tell, but his back's to the camera, so... Right, you don't get a good look at his face, but supposedly it is, and he's listed in IMDb as man with newspaper. Okay. Then we get some more stock footage, which I want to come back to because I found something cool out about it. Uh, and we hear Criswell's amazing narration. There comes a time in each man's life when he can't even believe his own eyes. Saucer seat over Hollywood. Yes. Oh, Criswell. Ooh. When I die, I'm putting it in my will that whoever does my eulogy has to do it exactly like Criswell. I don't care what you say. You just have to do it in that tone of voice with that cadence. You listening, Joshua Kennedy? Because it sounds like you might be the one that has to do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, since he's got the voice down. Is this the first time we meet Colonel Tom Edwards this in this segment? I believe so. I believe so as well. So Colonel Tom Edwards is in charge of the stock footage military. No, no, no. He's in charge of saucer field activities. Oh, sure. Exactly. Okay. 
<laughs> Colonel Edwards played by Tom Keene. And is he just up against like a sheet? Where is he supposed to be? He's in some sort of video void. Yeah. I'm not sure exactly where he is, but... I wonder if it's a green screen that they just didn't put anything on because they didn't think about it. Because Ed would. You know, somebody could take that shot, I'm sure, and green screen, you know, chroma key something in because it is just kind of a blank slate behind him. Yeah. And it looks like the consistency of the fabric looks... It looks like a movie screen. It doesn't look like fabric fabric. It looks more plasticky. Well, you know, we've been calling it military operations and attacking saucers or whatever, but really... Let's be clear here. This was simply a training maneuver. Because aliens don't exist. Right. It was just a little bit of practice firing at the clouds. Just a little bit. There is a couple points I want to make about this wonderful stock footage. Uh-huh. uh-huh. There is a, one of the pieces of stock footage shows a bunch of soldiers that are loading some rocket launchers. It's mm-hmm. about a minute into this section. And if you look behind him, there is a bunch of buildings that look like they have made out of thatch, thatch roofs and everything. It's actually stock footage from the Korean War. And this is supposedly happening outside of Washington, D.C. So there's a bunch of Koreans living outside of Washington, D.C., I guess. Scott, you know, Edward was kind of allergic to the word continuity. I mean, come on. <laughs> but the best piece of stock footage, in my opinion, uh, happens about a minute in 45 seconds into this section. And it really proves that these aliens are bringing Cold War rivals together. The U.S. and the USSR appear to be working together against them because there is what looks like a Katusha multiple rocket launcher firing. And a Katusha is actually a Russian truck that shoots rockets off the back. So... It's actually some stock footage of the of that uh, machine from um, World War II by the Soviets. But watching that gives me a good feeling to know that the U.S. and the USSR are, are teaming together to stop the saucers. Take that, Rocky Three. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's in this section here that we have a particular line of dialogue, which is why we yes! earmarked this section for Dominique, because she loves this line. And if can you recite it off the top of your head? Do you know it that well? So this is the colonel guy whose name I already forgot, even though everybody said it two seconds ago. So that's the kind of role I'm on. But anyway, (laughs) he looks at the the other soldier and he says, For a time, we tried to contact him by radio, but no response. Then they attacked a town, a small small town, town, I'll I'll admit, admit, but nevertheless, a town town of people, people people who who died. died. (laughs) That is, in fact, the greatest line that has ever been put on celluloid. And when I hear that line, every time since I saw another movie, every time I think of that, my mind goes, I wonder if that was Grover's Mill, New Jersey. (laughs) 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 Okay. Well, here. Nice. If you'll allow me the opportunity to plug Monster Kid Radio, that Grover's Mill, New Jersey thing made me think of War of the Worlds. And just a couple of weeks ago on Monster Kid Radio, there was a recording of what happened after Dominique, this Dominique, Dominique Lamsey, the one on the show right now, saw War of the Worlds, the original, for the very first time. It was from a screening a couple of years back at this point, but, you know, I finally put it on the show. Go check out episode 422 of Monster Kid Radio. You know, when you're done listening to this podcast. Okay, here's my thing about Edward. Here's one of the things I love about Edward. First of all, I love this line because Edward is always on the verge of saying something profound. There are profound things in his head. He just doesn't know how to word and make them come out. Another line that I like is going to come later when we when we actually get on, what was it, Space Station 7 with the aliens. But this movie is actually... Really philosophical, completely ineptly philosophical, but it's one of those beautiful things where Ed actually is trying to communicate something. He really is. He has an idea. He has a thing that he's trying to communicate here. And for me, what this scene, I mean, there's the stock footage and there's, you know, the cheesy dialogue, but this scene is all about the conspiracy. There's a conspiracy going on that the government is hiding from us. He's the commander for field saucer operations. This is an actual title. And we can look at this as just crappy writing, or we can look at this as the government has things that they're hiding from us. Was Edward actually a conspiracy theorist? Or was he just playing on the conspiracy theorist for the purpose of this movie? Because when Scott talks about 
them coming together, the Americans and the Soviets, because of the stock footage. Well, the aliens, they're lying to us about the aliens. What if they're lying to us about the Cold War? What if there is no Cold War? And the, the Americans and the Soviets, like, work together all the time, and they just don't tell us for their own reasons, you know? I've personally always loved the conspiracy angle in Edwards' talk. He calls it straight out because at one point he says um, that the whole thing was covered up by the higher echelon. He says you take yeah. fire, any earthquake or any major disaster and then wonder. Yeah. So, yeah, he's Ed Wood or, and through Colonel Edwards is really pushing that the government is covering up what they're doing. Yeah. The government is up to something and they're not telling us. So, listeners, we're recording the various sections of Plan 9 out of order just to accommodate people's schedules. And I don't know if this will be the first time this comes up in the podcast episode order, but it is not the first time it's come up in the recordings that we've done with people that there is something kind of sublimely deep accidentally about a lot of Ed Wood's films. And I think this movie's got a lot of it. There's another line of dialogue that takes place up in space station seven. I don't know if it's the same one that you were talking about, but there's another line of dialogue that we'll get to here in a second that I think is, is fairly profound and really this movie's got a lot more going for it than just, Oh, it's a cheesy, you know, science fiction, whatever movie. Um, it, it's got some real meat if you go looking for it. One of the things I always think of when I think about Ed Wood, um, I'm a huge Mystery Science Theater fan. And I got the chance to see Trace Ballou and Frank Conniff when they came to town. So they were doing live riffing. And the first movie I ever saw them do was Glenn or Glenda. Now they said, we're going to do this movie because it's a bad movie. There's just no way around it. It's a terrible movie. Glenn or Glenda is just, oh my God, Glenn or Glenda is borderline too bad even for me and that's saying something but frank made a point of saying that whatever fun they make of this movie they are not making fun of ed wood and they are not making fun of the idea of the movie because we all need to understand this movie was made out of compassion he wanted people to understand the fact that he was a cross-dresser that other people were cross-dressers this is what cross-dressers life was like he wanted to help people understand something. That's where the movie came from. And that is where all Ed Wood movies come from. All the movies he did that were anti-porno, although he ended up doing porno anyway, but that's kind of what you'd expect from Ed. Um, <laughs> he was one of those guys who would talk the talk and then not walk the walk in a lot of ways. He wasn't just making these movies for a quick buck. He was making these movies because he had something he wanted to say. And I don't think a lot of people appreciate that. Oh, I'm sure I've, the people who are listening to this podcast do. I'm 99% positive of that. But the typical ironic watcher does not. Well, I felt for many years watching all sorts of, of Ed Wood films, not just Plan 9, that he's always got something he wants to say. He's got an idea for a good movie. The problem, I think, is his writing. And if he could, if he could have found somebody that could have helped him write better, someone that had that had similar thoughts, because the ideas of these movies, they're there. There's some good ideas in these movies. There's some good things to be said. It's his execution that sometimes falls a little short for me. Yeah, he's overreaching his abilities. It's also to his credit that he still tried. Everybody oh, told him he definitely. was a screw up. And he had no talent because he was a screw up and he had no talent, but he kept going. And most of us don't do that. Well, I think a lot of it also has to do with the people that he surrounded himself with. If he had surrounded himself or, or found another, uh, a group of folks who were able to help raise his game just a little bit more. And there's something to be said for, you know, these are the people that you came up with. These are the people that have assembled around you because they believe in you. And that, that's great. And, you know, I've experienced that in my life. I've got a lot of wonderful people around me. I'm fortunate that all the people around me are also as creative, if not more so, than I am. <laughs> and, and I do wonder if Ed Wood would have benefited from having maybe just a few more people around him that could help him raise his game just a little bit more. And then maybe we would have had that execution because they're there with him. I, I don't know. It's a lot of what if, you know. I think that would have helped a lot, yeah. Well, we are talking, we did talk a little bit about Space Station 7. That, this is the first appearance of Space Station 7 in the film. Yes, it is. So we get to see where the flying saucers come from. Uh, an odd yeah, looking. Twenty minutes into the film, we get the plot. Yeah, 
<laughs> and we get to meet the ruler played by Bunny Breckenridge, uh, or, or John Breckenridge is his given name, I suppose, but Bunny Breckenridge is what he went by. Uh, he was uh, a drag queen throughout the 50s and, and throughout the rest of his life, really. There's, his story's a little sad, actually. But this was, I believe, his only film appearance. He acted on stage, but I don't think he did many other film uh, yeah, pieces. this is his only um, uh, listing in IMDb is Plan 9. Now, Bunny, Mr. Breckenridge, is actually descendant from American politics. He is the great-grandchild of U.S. Vice President John Breckenridge, uh, who was uh, vice president shortly after the Civil War. So he's got some you know, political lineage. However, he was born in France. So he's a Frenchman who is <laughs> uh, related <laughs> to some American politicians. And he was incredibly wealthy. Despite that, he kind of came into the circle because he was crashing on uh, Paul Marco's couch. Why he was crashing on Marco's couch, I don't know, because he had tons of money. But that's kind of how it went. And that's how he got involved into this little circle, this bizarre Ed Woodian circle, and got involved with the film. He's an interesting character. Uh, clearly, he is not comfortable with the memorized lines uh he's clearly reading a script and i think that's played up for laughs in the ed wood film starring johnny depp with bill murray portraying him but he still has this kind of regalness and i don't know if that's some of the drag queen coming out or what but i i could see him being in charge yeah it's the drag queen and i think it's just being french because when she i didn't know he was born in france and you say oh he's born in france i'm like oh there it is they have that they have that vibe so yeah i totally that totally makes sense to me but yeah, he's in charge. You can totally see he's in charge. Sure. I mean, they all defer to him. And this is the first time we mentioned Plan 9 as well. Like Dominique said, this is where we get the plot. It's all pretty much spelled out for us, what's happening in this film. And we finally find out what Plan 9 is. And there's a line of dialogue in here that I love. You know, it's an interesting thing when you consider the Earth people who can think. Yeah. Are, are so, so frightful of those, those who cannot. cannot referring to the living people being afraid of the animated dead people. And just that line by itself just is kind of deep. There, there's a lot you can read into Eros. that. Is that's that Eros, Eros saying? Whoever, yeah. Yeah. Whoever's Eros. saying it, it's great. Um, yeah. It's, it's kind of a deep line and kind of right. It's absolutely right. You realize that in one throwaway line, Ed Wood completely summed up the entire horror genre by accident. Yeah. That's what the genre is, man. Yep. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. And after this sequence, we have more flying saucers doing flying saucer things. And then we come back to the Trent household. Did you have something, though, Scott? Before we leave Space Station 7, there's one thing that I discovered this time watching this movie. Eros actually reports to the ruler saying, we had to put in here to Space Station 7 for regeneration. We're returning to the planet Earth immediately thereafter. And with that comment, I think I can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that these aliens are part Borg, or at least they model themselves after the collective because they have to go through regeneration. You just connected Ed Wood to Star Trek. <laughs> wow. Scott just won. Like life. <laughs> I, I am 100% okay with that. I'm not enough of a Star Trek fan to like agree or disagree with it, but I'm okay with it. You know what? We'll take it. <laughs> That's right, yeah, because they're always talking about regeneration. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we get back down to the Trent household, <laughs> and uh, Jeff is about to leave for a little while. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and this begins such a touching scene between Jeff and Paula Trent. Touching. That That is the word I was thinking when I watched it. <laughs> that is the word in my head when I watched that. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about the precautions that... Jeff tells Paula she needs to take in the next segment with the next host on the next episode of the podcast. I'm going to go ahead and spoil it. The fourth episode of Plan 9 by 9, the next episode you're going to hear, our special guest is Kenny Blows talking about Plan 9 from Outer Space and what the movie means to him and what he learned about the movie and some things that he found out when he was doing his research. It'll be a good time, so stay tuned. You know, when you're done listening to this episode, there's a nice little bit of dialogue here, too, that I, I really like that. I think if they had taken just one more take of this scene, it would have come off a lot better. Mm -hmm. But when Paula says the, the saucers, saucers are up, up there, there and the cemeteries out there, but I'll be locked up in there, you know, maybe kind of emphasize the words a little differently or maybe, I don't know, improv a little bit, because that's really an awkward line. 
Actually, if you change when she says, and I'll be in there, and she like points to the house, if she had have said, and I'll be in here, I think it would have made the whole thing sure. work just fine. Just just change one or two words, just the triple there in one sentence, just, man. Yeah. And, and the way she does not emphasize there, or the way she differently yeah. emphasizes the word there, it's just, it's awkward. This is the Ed Wood people make fun of. I also like the interplay between Jeff and Paula at the very beginning of the scene where Jeff tells Paula that she should go into town and stay with her mother. And Paula's reaction is basically that uh, this is our house. I'm going to stay here. But then she says, besides, most men try to keep their wives away from going home to mama. That's that's that Ed Wood dialogue, though, that it, just, just a little bit more. It just, it's got something. Yep. I do wonder if there was anything intentionally kind of under the surface when she talks about how she reaches over to touch Jeff's pillow so she doesn't feel lonely uh, while he's gone. She reaches over to touch it and she doesn't feel lonely anymore. I, I don't know if there's anything intentionally under the surface, but I suppose if you look at it squinted a little bit, yeah, maybe there's something going on there about how she keeps herself satisfied while he's gone. I, okay. Maybe I'm reaching. Maybe I'm reaching. I don't know. I, I think you're going a little, little bit too far there because – it's just like having someone to hold, not necessarily in a sexual way, but just the comforting of somebody being there. And I think that she's substituting the pillow for that. And, you know, of course, that's the same way I feel about my Inspector Clay pillow. So. <laughs> Do we need to have a Jeff Trent pillow made, though, for all the Paulas in the world? <laughs> You guys let me know if anybody wants it. I'll do it. <laughs> okay. Here, here's where I'm going to disagree with both of you. Okay. That scene is proof that the movie was written by a dude. Okay. Oh, I, I agree she, with you. Yes. I, I think you, y'all are reading way too much into it. Cause see when she says, besides most men try and keep their wives from going home to mama. Most men don't want their wives to go home to their mom. First thing that popped into my head, oh, right, this is the 50s. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and to me, it's just, it's it's weird, and it's creepy, and she's just kind of some kind of weird codependy, not able to take care of herself, even though her husband works as a pilot and does this all the time, she still somehow hasn't managed to get over that emotionally. So I actually kind of feel sorry for him because his wife is maybe off her rocker a little bit. Oh, when I, when I brought that line up, I was trying to reference that. Yeah. It is a typical fifties line. That yeah. line would never fly today. Oh yeah, absolutely not. <laughs> oh no, not at all. Not at all. I mean, that probably would have worked all the way up to the eighties perhaps, but yeah, uh, it clearly was written by a guy. Now, granted, Ed Wood had some non-traditional traits when it came to the quote-unquote typical masculine kind of guy but yeah that was clearly written by a dude I, I totally agree with you dominic but i don't i don't think i agree with your comment about her being off her rocker i feel sorry for her that she doesn't have anything that she's doing whether it's a job or whether it's a hobby or whatever that defines her as a person she's defining herself by either her husband or her family and, and that's, that's a, a problem I have in, in this movie. And it's a typical 50s problem is there's nothing that defines her as a person. I can actually see that. Keeping in mind that Ed Wood tried to put messages into his movie. What if we reverse engineer that? And what if that's supposed to be him saying, hey, look, this sucks? Could be. Yeah. I mean, she's a girl. So, of course, she's going to end up as a victim. But, I mean, shortly after he leaves, she ends up as a victim. So... I don't know where I was going with that, but it worked in my head. No, I, I could I see where you're going with that, though. It, it could be kind of a shining a spotlight uh, on something. So, yeah, I could see that. And it's really interesting. I feel like by watching the movie the way that we have for this podcast, just, you know, chunk by chunk, nine minute segments at a time, we're able to pick up on some of these things. When we take them just slightly out of context, we're able to read more into it and see some of these things. I don't think she's off her rocker, but I don't know if I'm going to go straight to Scott's side here either. I'm kind of in the middle regarding her status, but yeah, it's typical fifties, typical keep her away from the mother-in-law. Oh, wouldn't that be bad? Ha ha ha. You know? So mm. yeah, I could see that. In the rest of the movie, I mean, she's not particularly stupid. No. I mean, I'm not going to say she's breathtakingly smart, but against average fifties movie women, she's, she, she's a step above, maybe two steps above. She 
does do the the fainting kind of like oh no stuff towards the end of the movie when she sees the the monsters or whatever uh and yeah. in the next section the next episode she does forget to do something that would have kept the Bela Lugosi standing out of her house in the next nine minutes but still I mean she's not totally helpless she's got a little bit of I don't want to say agency, but just a little bit going for here that you don't see in a lot of some of the more lower budget movies of this era, especially when you get away from genre. Just look at maybe some of the exploitation films of the time. The women really aren't as fleshed out as she could have been. But also she has a bunch of scenes with the military dudes and doesn't she stand up to them? Yeah. Okay. The men are going to go smoke a cigar over here. Why don't you go clean up or something? Nothing like that. They don't exclude her. They don't kick her out of the conversation or the room. So there is that. Yeah. But I also, I remember, doesn't she just mouth off to him a couple times when they're trying to tell Jeff to shut up or something like that? I don't know if Maybe it's I'm, her, but I know Tana, the alien woman, she does. Yeah. Yeah. In, in that section that we recorded with uh, Chris McMillan, which listeners all have to look forward to. So that that's coming up down the line because that does come up there too. Uh, and this scene pretty much ends with them still saying goodbye to each other. And there we go. There, There's this section of the film. Kind of glossed over a couple of things. I want to go back to the stock footage at the beginning of this sequence, if we could. Uh, uh-huh. Some of this stock footage uh, was from, uh, well, whatever library Edward got it from. We see the old ABC station, but we also see some scenes from Sunset Strip, including a nightclub where Eartha Kitt is playing. Did you catch that, Dominique? Because I know you I like Eartha Kitt. I absolutely caught that, yeah. <laughs> link this to star trek now we can link it to batman 66 there you go there you go so this is the macombo nightclub which was a famous nightclub on sunset strip at 8588 sunset boulevard and it took a little digging Uh, actually my wife brenda helped me out a little bit when we went online and started looking up this place and trying to find out more information about it it was right next to larry finley's restaurant larry finley was a popular radio broadcaster who had a radio show he broadcast from his restaurant and he actually tried to get a big radio uh broadcasting company i guess or network off the ground called pbs it wasn't what we know as pbs now it's uh, something else but uh, he didn't quite work out the way he wanted it to but he he was a big radio guy and then right next to it was the nightclub where eartha kit was performing and it looks like this stock footage may have come from 1953 when she headlined there uh, she did appear there a couple of times and it was kind of a big deal because she's a black woman Mm-hmm. And she's bringing in the crowds. It, it was kind of a big yeah. deal for her to uh, to be there. In fact, the nightclub had to uh, extend the number of shows per day she was doing, kind of changing a tradition they had had or a policy they had in place to do more shows per night and fit more people in because she was such a draw. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was pretty interesting to see that stock footage pop up here, especially since Dominique and I have recently off mic talked a little bit about Catwoman from Batman and knowing that Eartha Kitt's her preferred Catwoman out of all three of them. That was kind of cool. And it came up in this section. Yep. Yeah, you mentioned also uh, seeing ABC Yeah. in this section. Actually, at the end of part two of our nine minutes, uh, it actually flies by NBC and CBS as well. Yeah. Huh. You know, at the time, the three major networks. Right on. Do you think that was intentional or he just grabbed whatever he could? My gut says that it was intentional, thinking maybe somewhere down the line, if it actually made it to network television, he could obscure the other two somehow and just promote the one that was ever showing it, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Well, he did have a, a pilot for a TV show. So it might have been that, you know, I'll use this to be all like, I like your network. Yep. yep, kind of or hedging his bets a little bit. Uh, yeah. David Duchovny uh, of X-Files tells a joke that the only reason his character's name in the X-Files was Fox Mulder is because they were pitching the series to Fox, that if they had pitched it to ABC <laughs> or CBS, that would have been his first name instead. But yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, whatever works. But now there is another nightclub that we see uh, after the after that sequence. I was not able to identify it. And, and my wife and I just really scrutinized it to try to figure out what it was uh we, we couldn't nail it down at all but we did see that the nightclub was showing or was headlining june christie who was another american singer worked in jazz uh and uh the other person there i wrote it down francis fay she was the other singer and her name is the one that appears in the banner that's kind of strung up on top of the marquee whereas june christie's name is actually on the marquee uh, francis fay was another uh, jazz singer uh, of the era 
But I thought it was kind of neat to kind of see some Sunset Strip locations here. Now, there is a street address listed on the building where the one guy comes out with the liquor bottle and then sees the uh, UFOs and you hear the, the line from Criswell, there comes a time in each man's life, you can't believe what he sees. Mm-hmm. I couldn't figure out what building that was. Uh, there's a number, but that's it. I, I assume it's somewhere in LA where Edward was shooting. I just would love to find out what real building it was because one of the things that we've done, at least in the first segment of this podcast, was we were able to track down Bela Lugosi's house, the old man's house. And it'd be neat to kind of track down some of these other locations. So if any listeners have any ideas about what that location is, I'd be eager to hear it. Okay. Random aside. Did you guys find the cemetery that was in the beginning? Cause that's like my new obsession. I need to find out that where the cemetery is. Oh, from uh, the first part of the film. I don't think we've yeah. tracked that down. Have we? No, no, we haven't. Okay. okay. Scott, what else do you have to say about this section? Gregory Walcott, who uh, is the pilot. Jeff, one of the things that in our podcast history, uh, Derek and I have done Uh episodes, I would always uh, remark on what actors or actresses had Disney connections. And I have neglected to do this so far, but Gregory Walcott actually appeared on a show called Texas John Slaughter which was a Western television series that aired 17 episodes between 1958 and 1961 as part of the wonderful world of Disney. Walcott actually appeared on two episodes in 1960, Geronimo's Revenge and Kentucky Gunslick. So we do have a Disney connection other than the fact that uh, Disney was part of the uh, company that made uh, Ed Wood, but actually one of the actors in Plan 9 has a Disney connection. Wow! See, I actually didn't know a lot about, okay, like the normal people in Plan 9. Like, I knew about (laughs) Tor Johnson and Vampire and stuff. And I was surprised to find out that, yeah, Wolcott is like an actor, like a legitimate actor. Yes. (laughs) And that got me thinking because, like, okay, one of the reasons I never thought he would be a legitimate actor is because I don't think he's very good in Plan 9. I'm sure he's fine in other stuff. I just, th- I just he's not good in this movie. He's pretty stiff. Yeah, yeah. He, that's what I was going to say. He's he's wooden in this film. Did you guys ever see The Happening? Yes. M. Night Shyamalan movie? <laughs> yes, I have. Okay. I, I have not, but I have listened to podcasts about it. It kind of reminded me of that because I'm watching The Happening and I'm like, dude, I know Mark Wahlberg is a better actor than this. I'm not saying he's the greatest actor ever. I'm saying he's better than this. I've seen it. <laughs> so I don't know what M. Night Shyamalan did to make Mark Wahlberg a, a piece of plywood, but I think Ed Wood unintentionally did that to Walcott <laughs> in this movie. Uh, maybe. Yeah. Now, Tom Keen also had one heck of a career as well. He did a lot of Westerns, a lot of mm-hmm. Westerns, uh, going back to, I'd say probably the silent era, because there are some credits for him going back to the late 20s. So, you know, he was also a quote unquote real actor as well. The internet calls him the ruggedly handsome cowboy actor. (laughs) I I suppose I could see that, but there are some people in this film that, that had careers going into all of this Mm -hmm. or or would eventually have careers outside of this as well. Um, But again, we have people like Breckenridge who only had this one film. So Uh, speaking of Breckenridge, I do want to go back to him. Uh, Like I said, he did have kind of a, a sad story. I feel like. Shortly after Plan 9 uh, was produced, he did get arrested because he took two uh, minors, two underage boys, to Vegas with him. Uh, and he was arrested for, uh, what was the exact charge? I had to hear a second ago. Probably contributing to the delinquency of a minor. Something, something along that, something those lines. Like, something along those lines. Yeah. And, you know, it is what it is. He was uh, 10 counts of sex perversion. Oh, okay. And he was committed to a, a facility and then released the following year. He continued to do stage work. Uh, he wanted to change his sex. And a couple of times he actually announced that he was going to go do this thing. He was going to go to Mexico to have it done. Actually, that was the second place he was going to go do it. He was going to go over to Europe to have it done the first time around. And things just kept popping up. When he was going to go to Europe, uh, he, the court stepped in and said, hey, you can't leave town yet. You owe money to your mother. And then when he was going to go down to Mexico to do it, there was a car accident that prevented him from going down. And he never lived that part of his dream, his life to do that. And, uh, you know, I feel bad because he clearly wanted to do these things and had the ability to do so. He had the money, Mm -hmm. but the circumstances kept popping up that prevented him from making that change in his life. So I do feel kind of bad for him. He did have a daughter. He was married to somebody short for a brief period of time. Uh, and the daughter at one point actually lived here in Oregon, but I can't find her, but I, I do feel bad for him. I feel like his life probably could have 
gone a little differently. Yeah, been happier. Yeah. B, what do we need to do to make you happy, Scott? Silence. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already happy. I got to talk about Plan 9 some more. <laughs> Are you touching your Tor Johnson pillow? <laughs> <laughs> It's reaching out. To, it's reassuring that it's there. You don't feel lonely anymore. <laughs> oh, yes. boy. You know, this section of the film is pretty darn iconic because we are on the space station uh, and we've got some great lines. You know, I'm really glad you picked this section because, you know, I love talking about this kind of stuff with you, Dominique, either on Monster Kid Radio or in person. So this was awesome. Has Ed Wood ever influenced your writing? He hasn't influenced my writing directly. He's influenced my philosophy on life. I believe very firmly in something called the art of failure. Because my, my favorite directors are like Ed Wood, Takashi Shimizu, who did uh, The Grudge and those J-horror movies, and like Stephen Summers. And the thing about all these people is you know watching their movies that in their head what they're seeing is glorious and beautiful. And they just can't quite make it to the screen. But they keep trying. And they don't compromise what they do. Like if you've ever watched the uh, Jew on the original Japanese grudge, it really doesn't make sense. There's nonlinear time. There's all this weird philosophical stuff. But the thing is that is in every one of Shimizu's pieces. That's what he does. That's his thing because that's what he's trying to do. Again, Ed Wood always has something he wants to say, but he can't quite say it. The example I like to use is this indie movie from like the early 2000s called Forget Me Not. And I love this movie. It's not very good, but they try very hard and they almost get there. And for me, that is more valuable to the horror genre as a whole and to life as a whole than doing something safe and making it perfect because that movie to me is infinitely better than Friday the 13th part 20. If you try, even if you can't do it, you need to try. There's this wonderful quote from Niccolo Machiavelli of all people. It's in the introduction to the art of war. Okay. He talks about how, if you're in an archery competition and you have three targets and one is close to you, one's middle range away, and one is really far from you, you always, always, always aim at the farthest one because the chances of you hitting it are minuscule. But that arrow is going to go a whole hell of a lot farther than if you aim for the one that's closest to you that you know you can hit. And that's what Ed Wood does. He aims for that farthest target, and he screws it up miserably. But the person who actually takes that chance gets my respect more than somebody who succeeds at something easy. That's why I love Ed Wood. Dominique, have you considered writing something about the philosophy? I, don't, I think I think you kind of <laughs> nailed it. I, I, I was sitting here on mute so that you wouldn't hear me coughing because of my cold, but I was sitting here kind of nodding along like, yeah, yeah, tell him, Dominique. <laughs> <laughs> Especially about Plan 9, you realize that this movie, every single person in the world, we've all thought of this, the plot of this movie, independently of Ed Wood, before we knew that this movie existed. We created this movie in our head. And most of us, it was when we were seven and some of us had dinosaurs in it. But we all had this movie in our heads. The difference between you and me and Ed Wood is that Ed Wood did it. I didn't make that movie. You didn't make that movie. He made it. And that's why I love him. And that's why I love him probably more than I love you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. Well, I won't take that personally, but. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to write something Ed would like is, is, it's, I mean, I mean, come on, I can do better than that. <laughs> but that philosophy behind how you work, I think is more important. I don't know how to top that. Scott, you got anything? <laughs> Silence. Did we lose Scott altogether? Matt, are you still here? Other than the fact that I am incredibly impressed with the way that you wrapped Ed Wood's career together, I can't make any additional comments. It's a, I agree with you 
All right. Well, why don't we go ahead and, and wind up this episode on that and thank Dominique for spending some time with us today and, and talking about this. Again, check out her Etsy shop, The House of Silent Graves. There will be a link in the show notes here. And why not? We'll put a link in the uh, on the website itself proper so people can find it too. Uh, also, if you are interested in any of her writing, whether it's about movies or other pieces of fiction or whatever you can find her at the university of the bazaar where she says she thinks too much about dead people and batman so you don't have to so check that out as well it's like wordpress site at the university of the bazaar.wordpress.com and just pay attention to the coolest upcoming anthologies coming out because chances are dominique's got a story in them here's hoping there you go <laughs> well um that's it the end I don't know what else to say. Take us home, Scott. Yeah, I just wanted to thank Dominic for joining us as well. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. And I always enjoy when you're on uh, Monster Kid Radio as well. So thanks for spending some time with us. And thank you both for inviting me because, yeah, any chance to talk about Ed Wood, I will take. And also, I wanted to thank you once again for my amazingly awesome pillow. Mm-hmm.